So it's never clever to disrespect private property. And you don't need to go far. Look at what happens when a country, a nation, a people disrespects the ownership of private property. Look at Zimbabwe now. Zimbabwe has agreed to pay $3.5 billion in compensation to white farmers whose land was taken by the government to resettle black families, moving a step closer to resolving one of the most divisive policies of the Mugabe era. We have taken uh, this farm. There's only one problem. The Southern African nation doesn't have the money. If you want it, one acre. All these years later, 24, since they started Robert Mugabe's land grabs that he called land reform, it was land reform by vigorous means, by taking over farms, farms where people had jobs, farms that were productive. 24 years later, now they embarrass themselves and they're wanting to pay these farmers, 444 of them. So you're going to pay them $3.5 billion for these farms that you took over from them by force after kicking them out 24 years ago and a lot of these farms have become far less productive than they were. While all the commercial farms owned by big corporations, all those farms have been running just fine. This is why you need to prevent this sort of thing and should protect private property rights. Was there colonialism? Was there dispossession? Yes. Was it necessary to have a land reform policy? I would say yes, because the tensions, you have the sort of tensions and scenario that can be used by a man like Robert Mugabe to point people right at a white farmer and make that white farmer responsible for all the things that happened to their grandfathers and use it to dispossess them back for the benefit of the party, ZANU-PF and Robert Mugabe. And this is something we should definitely not allow in South Africa. We should avoid this. All land reform policy and all land reform actions should actually be very tight and very formal. You've actually had the opposite of that. You've had very loose, very slow land reform that gets held up in the courts by people on purpose for a very long time. When that is allowed to happen, a politician comes along like that dreadful Robert Mugabe and he can then wield that against certain farmers and against certain farms to poke and prod and take money out of there. You think the commercial farms weren't a product of dispossession as well? Of course they were, but they probably paid Robert Mugabe and ZANU-PF off and are still making those payments, or they had some leverage that they could use against the government of Zimbabwe at the time. These people who are now occupying the farms that dispossessed the white Zimbabwean farmers don't have title deeds either. The bottom line we have in this country no one has got security of tenure. And secondly, no one can trade that. So if you go bust, who do you give your title deeds to? And what are your title deeds worth? So fast track land reform took away probably about $3 billion worth of collateral, which farmers could borrow. The new farmer can't borrow against his land and the development. So, so, so that's a major issue. That's a major hindrance issue to him. So you've got to get tradable title. The only way you can get tradable title that is acceptable to the people in commerce and the people in the banks is by being politically correct. And the whole problem is let's get politically correct amongst ourselves so that we can get on and bring this country back up to the agricultural uh, level it was known for. They can't really sell the land. They tried, but who's going to buy land that's not protected. And here's the thing. If the land is not protected in that country, how can you invest there? How can you put your own money in there? Because your farm can be taken. Your land can also be taken. It's important that South Africa learns from this lesson and does not go down this foolish road. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Private property is about exclusive ownership. That your property is your property. Your assets belong to you as an individual or as an entity and are not communally owned by the state or the community. Because when they come for your land, it's not just the 444 farmers that were dispossessed. There's about 650 black farmers that were dispossessed in Zimbabwe as well. And no one talks about that because once you don't own your land, 
The government can do whatever they want to you for whatever they want, and it's usually at the whim of some politician. You have no legal rights. Doug Stanley loves the smell of freshly turned earth. The sight of his harvest makes it all worth the hard work. Farming is in his blood. Now he's working in Zambia, having been driven off his farm in Zimbabwe by supporters of President Robert Mugabe 14 years ago. I bought my farm after independence, you know, and I got clearance from the government to say that they weren't interested in that land. And then, uh, you know, to be told to move along, you know, it's quite a thing. Eh? You, do, you do, do all that development. Private property gives you legal ownership. It allows you to use and sell or to rent or to transfer the property as you see fit. You cannot be just dispossessed of it at the point of a gun or under duress or threat from the government and its pawns. You're supposed to be protected under the law and under the institutions of that government that exist to protect your private ownership of land or anything else. If they infringe on that, that's theft, right? 4,000 white farmers were forced off the land, damaging Zimbabwe's agriculture industry. Its main export crop, tobacco, has almost recovered. But the maize harvest, which has also been hit by years of drought, remains too low to feed the nation. People are dying of starvation. There's no food. You know, we are we now living in Zambia, and there's quite a few Zimb Zimbabwe farmers here in Zambia. And we are ex actually exporting food to Zimbabwe. Zambia isn't the only country benefiting from the Zimbabwean farmers' expertise. Many are in South Africa, Botswana and Mozambique too. Well, I know that uh, some ministers on the farm, but we actually drove through Zimbabwe five years ago and drove onto the farm and there was absolutely nothing happening on the farm. That's why you see people occupying land as they see fit, setting up their shacks and mkukus wherever they want because Julius Malema said they could. He says they can set up land there so people do. And what do people do? They set up little cartels, little mafias that take over pieces of land and then rent it or sell pieces of land that they don't own to other people at reduced prices, but it becomes very good business for those selling it. If you sell a piece of land that you don't even own for 4,000 rand, that's a free 4,000 rand, basically. And this is what has come into the country because politicians have been able to redirect people's angst about not having land and the unwillingness of the South African government to protect that land or to amend the laws that are supposed to protect that land and allowed this gap to exist where people like Julius Malema and others can take over land as they will. That's what happened in Zimbabwe, except that it wasn't some third tier fake TV communist doing it. It was the president of the country doing it right from the top and right from the blue house or whatever they call his house over there in Zimbabwe. Because there was no protection under the law. He was the law. One guy was. It is what it is. It is what it is. The economic systems that work best stand on private property. It becomes a fundamental aspect of free markets and mixed economies. If you have an economy where there's no private property being respected or legally protected, you have an economy where people are scared to invest. It wasn't only the white farmers who were affected. Their workers also suffered. Paul remembers living in fear of Mugabe's supporters. On the farm, he fled just before it was seized. He's also still hurt by what happened. The country is not about white, black, colored Indian. We are same. Uh, so like the government of Zimbabwe, uh, what they did to say we are taking farms from white, they were totally wrong. There are Zimbabweans who disagree. Many say they have benefited from the government's reforms. <laughs> but they were devastating for those forced off the land they'd invested time, money and so much more in. Why do little bumpkins like JJ Tabani, I know everyone loves him, I 50% like him and 50% don't. I sort of like him sometimes and sort of don't most of the time. JJ Tabani says some weird and some weird and irresponsible things. We have a new course available for our boys. It's for boys between the ages of 10 and 18. It's called the Men of the Bible course, Manhood, Masculinity, and Becoming a Man. 
we take the boys through 12 stories of men from the Bible, pulling out negative lessons, positive lessons, and then one major lesson. We round off each lesson with notable points on doctrine and theology. We need our young men to become men. One of the things he likes to hop on is that South African corporates, South African big business, should be investing in South Africa. Okay, thanks, JJ. Everyone agrees with that. However, how are you going to put your money into a government that's trying to move in the direction of Zimbabwe? Where if you build a factory, they can just take that factory. If you have a pension, they can just take that pension. If you have a piece of land, they can just take it. That's the direction the South African government has been hinting at moving at for at least 15 years now. And if the ANC is ever backed into a corner and they think having that policy will help them, do you think they'll use it? Of course they will. They haven't gotten to the point where they think people would be on their side. South Africans still respect private property, actually. They still see the incentive behind having private ownership of something. It encourages investment, maintenance, a sense of pride and self and self-sufficiency and having efficient resources that you can deploy at will. People still value that sort of thing in South Africa and they haven't been completely stupefied by Julius Malema and his friends or the ANC. The ANC itself has had to back off several times for 15 years on this, but what they have done, quite cynically, is run the land reform process very slowly and in a very corrupt way where the money benefits mostly their friends and their associates. And they cheat the people who are trying to claim for the land. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you, <laughs> we don't care. Private property is supposed to allow for di diverse forms of ownership, whether that's land, buildings, personal possessions like guns, intellectual property like arts, and the financial assets that you might have invested in. If you can't own things, your name means nothing in the country. These 444 farmers have been dispossessed over 20 years ago and they've been fighting this thing for 10 years. That shows that your citizenship and your name in that country doesn't mean anything because your title deed was treated as a piece of toilet paper and Robert Mugabe wiped his buttocks with it and everyone who's on those farms now has no title deed which means that the government essentially owns those places and they're allowing those people to live there illegally. This is chaos. This is a country without laws and without order. And this all stems for not respecting private property. That's why in South Africa we should avoid this at all cost. We should run away from it. Because private property comes with limitations. Property rights are restricted by the laws and the regulations and social obligations. And if those things don't mean anything, then what is your property then? What can you own? What can belong to you? It's high-tech crime at the highest level by the government and its associates. If you don't have private property in your country, can I tell you something? You don't even own your own life. Because if the government chooses to take your life, who's going to stand up for you? Under what law? Against the government that does not respect anything that that person owns? They could lose everything in a heartbeat if they say the wrong thing? That's why I think the, all these people standing up and saying, we should be like China. We should be like this. We should be like that. Robert Mugabe was clever, was a good man. He stood up against white monopoly capital and the whites. Those people are idiots. Zimbabwean government says it will start paying compensation to farmers who lost the land under former President Robert Mugabe's administration. The funds will be paid in installments with the first one to go out before the end of October. The government says this is part of a broader effort to revive the country's agricultural sector. People in Zimbabwe have been starving. They have been starving for two decades now. They've been going through droughts. They've been going through economic downturn. They've been going through sanctions. They've been going through being immigrants all over the world. And it all started with Robert Mugabe, one delusional, deranged lunatic, not respecting private property rights and not doing what presidents should be doing, good presidents anyway, and following the law instituting policy, creating regulations, and then rolling out that law to the ends that it was created to achieve, which is land reform. That would have been understandable, logical, and something he would have gotten credit for. But instead, he reacted emotionally, 
took down Zimbabwe and people's lives with him. But now, after 20 years of starving people, for what reason, they're going to pay $3.5 billion to the farmers. Come on now, dog. Come on, man. After all of that, starving all those people, going through sanctions, their currency dropping. People have been fleeing that place, trying to find work all over the world. 20 years of this stuff, and now you're going to pay that money. Should you not have just paid the money in the beginning then if it was going to be all this trouble? If you had no other way to do it that was reasonable, pay the money. And you might say, well, it was dispossessed, it was stolen, it was all of this. I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is, what is the best thing to do today for the economy, for the people, and for the longevity of the country? Preserve private property rights. And that's the thing we should always remember in South Africa and not stray away from. There should be a differentiation between things owned by the state and things owned by common property that are shared by groups and things owned by individuals. That's a proper country. And those sort of divisions should be respected. What's your understanding as the Chamber of Commerce, what this new program means and also the compensation um, for these farmers? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And uh, good morning to your viewers, too. Yeah, what's more significant is to have an appreciation of the background to which the compensation is taking place. The concept of private property has not always been respected over time and it evolved over time and has to be protected in every culture and in different economic systems. And we should protect it at all costs and not become like Zimbabwe because after starving your people for 24 years, now you're going to have to pay anyway. I'm wondering uh, if this agreement is able to, to, to be pulled off. Um, it could be a huge turning point, not only in terms of the current president sort of disassociating himself with uh, Robert Mugabe's policies, but sort of uh, heal some very, very uh, deep wounds in the country? Well, you know, I mean, it, it may also exacerbate tensions in the country amongst those who felt that there should be no compensation for uh, these farmers. Uh, in conclusion, a country that does not respect private property rights is doomed to fail. A saying... Life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Soren Kierkegaard. I recommend South Africa takes a lesson where we don't have to look backwards at a decrepit, starving population and say to ourselves, what is the best thing to do today? What is the principle that actually works? Private property, protect it, love it, institute it, and keep it in place so that government can have its rightful place and not overpower the market and the people and big business can invest and the individual's property rights across the board can be respected. The case is closed, my friend. If we go the way of Zimbabwe, we will not be revolutionaries. We will be idiots who in the end will have to pay anyway. Grow up. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and if you dare, buy us a coffee. A man running a fraud scheme selling fraudulent funeral policies fakes his own death. In an exclusive interview with the SABC, the new Johannesburg mayor, Cabello Guamanda, speaks out about DA claims that he ran a fraud scam. DA caucus leader and former mayor, Dr. Mpo Palatse, has alleged that Guamanda, through his entity, Itemba Lama Africa, swindled residents who had invested in a funeral and or investment scheme. However, Guamanda has, uh, has told Mbalentle Mtetwa that these allegations are an attempt by the DA to tarnish his reputation and he is planning to seek legal advice on the matter. He gets away with the money. He's never seen by the people he defrauded again until... 
Mayor Gabelo Guamanda's State of the City address was preceded by pomp and ceremony. He arrived in a motorcade led by the city's Metro Police while being ushered in by a praise singer. He pops up on television because he's becoming the mayor of the most economically powerful metro in the country of South Africa. The government of local unities audited financial statements reflected a city with a healthy cash balance of 6.6 .6 billion. After telling the people that he defrauded for funeral policies in Soweto through the people that worked for him that he's deceased. This is the story of the illustrious mayor, Gabelo Kwamanda. A mayor of the Al Jamal party and the mayor of Johannesburg from the 5th of May 2023 to the 16th of August 2024. This is a true story and this is South Africa. You get the leaders you deserve, South Africa. And you can say, well, I didn't vote for Al Jamal, I didn't vote for Gabelo Guamanda, whoever that is. But South Africans are voting for every single person that allowed Guamanda to become mayor. Guamanda became mayor after his fellow Al Jamal councillor, Tapelo Ahmed, resigned as mayor under pressure from everyone in the coalition and everyone in the public and the media because the man was wholly and totally unqualified. What, well, what would this loan potentially be for? It is for service delivery issues. It is for technologies, for smart city, where we can deploy. What smart city? A, a decade ago, we were talking about the installation of CCTV cameras in the city of Johannesburg. A few weeks ago, you signed a new memorandum of understanding, again, around cameras. And Correct. we see those cameras capturing crime that you are doing very little about because the inner city right now is such a dangerous place that people who don't have to be there don't venture there. You're so correct. how is it helping us? You are correct. Remember, I'm not in the office for the past decade. I'm only a month. No, no, no. And, I'm and, saying and, and this started correct. more than a decade ago. All right. You have belatedly, yeah. about two, three weeks ago, correct. signed a new memorandum of understanding. Correct. And yet we don't see the return on investment. There is. Where? There is in the city. Where, where Mr. <laughs> Mayor? How many people have you convicted as a result there of is. the installation of that technology? There is a few of them. What I, is a I, few? I, I'm telling you, there is a few of them. Uh, I, can't, I can't give you the, the, the number from the top of my head. The man was unqualified, so the ANC and the EFF couldn't agree on one of their people to be mayor, so they chose another Al Jamal person, and that was Cabello Comanda. He became mayor for a year, and guess what? Under his tenure, Bree Street, also known as Lillian and Goy Street, blew up, cracked open. In the most post-apocalyptic scene, taxis lifted off the ground, flying in the air, nearly crushing a man, the whole street just cracking and opening up, as if to swallow people and everything in its way and everything atop of it. This is the mayoral ship of Gabelo Guamanda, which lasted a year. But my goodness, these are the leaders you deserve, South Africa. Become a member of this channel today on our Buy Me A Coffee page. You'll get exclusive members-only content, which are courses 15 to 30 minutes long. We add a new one every single month on various topics linked to the channel. When you're a member, you get access to all of them on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Check it out, the link is in the description. Subscribe to the channel or Cyril Ramaphosa will be president forever. Since 2011, there's been nine mayors in the city of Johannesburg. Before that, from 2000 to 2011, there was one mayor. 11 years, Amos Masondo. Now that tells you something. Love him or hate him, he wasn't such a great mayor, but there was some sort of stability there, right? And if you want to get what you vote for, it's better to get the vote outright. He had the majority in the city, and that's why he could stay on for 11 years. He was followed by Paul Stau, one of the most overrated mayors and politicians you've ever seen. After Paul Stau, you had the very promising Herman Mashaba, who did some things from 2016 to 2019. He was ran out by his own party, the DA, for being too close to the EFF, allegedly. And he was actually not doing such a bad job, according to the public and other parties. The DA thought he was doing a terrible job. 
I don't know about you, but the seat of the Johannesburg mayor seems to be cursed. What do you mean by that? After that, you had Jeff Makubo of the ANC from the 4th of December 2019 to the 9th of July 2021. Let's call it just under two years. He didn't last very long. Then you had Jolly Dima Tonga from the 10th of August 2021 to the 18th of September 2021. He died in a car accident after only being there for just over a month. After him, from the 1st of August of 2021, you have Mpo Morero, who lasted just over a month himself till the 22nd of November 2021. He was replaced by Mpo Palazze. Dr. Palazze, good evening to you and uh, thank you for your time. You championed this particular matter. On the news of his arrest, let's start there. How are you feeling? Well, firstly, good evening, Willie, and most importantly, good evening to the residents of Johannesburg. Um, there's, there's been justice served to some extent. Um, the wheels of justice continue to turn. Um, I believe the, the former mayor is out on bail, so we, we watch very closely the developments, but this is definitely a step in the right direction. Yeah. It's taken too long. I don't believe it should have taken this long. Um, there's definitely some foul play. Firstly, there was compelling evidence. Uh, as you recall, the Financial Sector Conduct Authority said this entire operation was illegal, and that was last year already that their findings were made known. Um, and, and I understand that the warrant of arrest was issued in May already. That's five months ago. This is somebody in public office. He couldn't have been hiding. You know, um, he was still mayor from May till August. F from the time his warrant of arrest was issued, why was he not arrested then? Mm. Uh, why was he not arrested in August when, when, he, when he resigned as mayor? So that, that really begs the question, what else is happening behind the scenes? I don't know what it is, but something just seems off about him, Popaladze. Something just says, weirdo and off. There's something off about this woman. She came highly recommended by the DA because she's a doctor who entered politics and so on and so forth. And Mpo Palazze lasted nearly a year. She lasted nearly a year as mayor of Johannesburg from the 22nd of November 2021 to the 20th of September 2022. And every single day she was being challenged by the ANC and its partners to try and push her out. She was eventually pushed out replaced with Dada Morero. What an idiot this man is. He came in from the 30th of September to the 25th of October and was promptly pushed out. Not even a month. And he was pushed out in October of 2022 because the Johannesburg High Court ruled that Palazzo's removal from office and therefore Morero's election was unlawful and invalid. Meaning Mpo Palazzo could now come back in from the 26th of October 2022, lasting a couple of months until the 26th of January 2023 when she was pushed out by a coalition of the ANC and the EFF electing Tabelo Ahmed an incompetent who they promptly pushed out. Breaking news, Tabelo Ahmed resigns in the city of Johannesburg. I'm standing by with the latest. Because he only lasted a couple of months from the 27th of January 2023 to the 24th of April 2023. Replaced on the 5th of May 2023 by Mr. Fake Funeral Plan, Fake Death and Fake Mayor, Gabelo Guamanda of Al Jamar. I said, hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right. 5th of May 2023 to the 16th of August 2024. He lasted just over a year and then was pushed out. You could see that in uh, this guy. This guy's not up to the job. Gabelo Guamanda from day one was under suspicion because people were saying, doesn't this man have fraudulent charges? Doesn't this man have a scandal of running a fake funeral policy scheme in Soweto? People were saying this already back then when he took office in 2023, in May 2023. And it was pushed aside by Gabelo Guamanda himself in interviews. It was pushed aside by the alliance partners, EFF and ANC. And now... Action SA in Johannesburg has called an executive on executive mayor Data Morero to immediately remove councillor Cabello Guamanda from all his executive roles. Now, the former Johannesburg mayor handed himself over to police in Protea in Soweto on Friday. The Al Jamaa party member was granted bail when he appeared in the Johannesburg Magistrates Court for his alleged involvement in a fraudulent funeral policy scheme. Guamanda is currently a member of the mayoral committee for community development. Al Jamaa leader Hanif Hendricks has lauded Guamanda for his courage and for cooperating with the police. 
Cabello Commander had an arrest warrant out for him in April of 2024 and had to hand himself in after coming back from overseas and face the charges that were known all the way back in 2023 when people who thought he was dead saw him on television. Now he pops up undead like a zombie, looking like one too if you've ever seen this man, running Johannesburg after being installed by the ANC. You get the leaders you deserve. If this is the procession of who is leading Johannesburg, you have to ask yourself who is voting for these people. You have to ask yourself what is going on. And it's going on because no one has an outright majority. And you have the ANC at play, the EFF at play, Al Jamal, the Democratic Alliance giving half an effort with a creepy weirdo as mayor who convinces no one. It's just that she's not ANC. She's definitely not Mashaba who was far more capable, but now he's gone off on a tangent and is now working with the ANC. And honestly, Mashaba's decision to work with the ANC is not the craziest thing of this lot of people. He could say that's a political decision, whether you agree with it or not. Now Johannesburg is so fortunate and so blessed to have the return of another zombie mayor. <laughs> Data Morero. The priority is to perhaps sort out crime because Johannesburg is the most dangerous city in South Africa. So are you trying to say that perhaps documented foreign nationals should be hired because of the language barrier that police officers and JMPD face when they arrest uh, undocumented persons or those committing crimes from other African countries? Was that the, the, the thought process? The thought in the statement would have meant that, but unfortunately the discussions that we have entered in felt that at the current state in which you know we're experiencing high levels of unemployment and so on and so on, the view was that let's find other alternative methods uh, to help us address the language barrier, which may mean taking officers for training. It may mean that at certain instances, as the courts already do, have interpreters to help us to deal with some of the matters. Who earlier this year in 2024 said that the city should hire foreigners as metro police officers because there's so many foreigners in the city the metro police officers don't know what these people are saying so if you hire foreign immigrants to be metro police officers goodness according to dada morero's little brain you will now be solving the problem of foreigners committing crime in the city of johannesburg because now you can translate and you can understand what they say talk about missing the point dodo morero isn't the problem illegal immigration and the number of illegal immigrants, illegal foreigners in the city of Johannesburg, isn't that the problem? Not what languages the metro police can understand? This is the sort of brain you have running Johannesburg. All these mayors since 2011 and to tell you the truth, the city has not quite gotten better. The street blew up under Gabelo Guamanda, he was apparently dead, he defrauded people of funeral policies. If a man can defraud people using a funeral policy scheme, what do you think he's going to do as mayor? Be a saint, an honest person? Or is he controllable by the ANC and the EFF and Al Jamal, the people that gave him the seat, so that they could carry on doing whatever they want, especially the corruption and handing out tenders to themselves while they worked on getting Dada Morero back in 2024? He was just keeping the seat warm because he's a non-entity, he's a nobody. I mean, the man's supposed to be dead, isn't he? Okay. You get what you vote for, South Africa. In conclusion, the best thing is to go out and support a conservative party with strict conservative principles, and you must vote them in outright. Whether it's for your local election in 2026, for your mayor, or for your ward councillor, or whether it's the national election in 2029, and try to vote for them outright. Because if you don't, this is what you get. The saddest game of musical chairs you've ever seen and what is the result? The most powerful economic city in the country is being run like this. Vote in conservatives and vote them in outright. A saying, people demand freedom of speech as a compensation for the freedom of thought which they seldom use. It's important to remember that you get the leaders you deserve. So you must use your freedom of speech, which voting is a part, to vote in the right people. And I would recommend considering a conservative party and voting them in outright. It's important that you try and do your part to get that done by voting and even before the vote, doing a little activism of your own and getting people to vote 
aligned with those values, those conservative values, and voting in a party outright that you know can do the job whether you love them or hate them, to vote strategically so that you avoid people like Gabelo Kwamanda. The case is closed, my friend. Gabelo Kwamanda is not dead. He is, in fact, very much alive. He is a fraudster. He is a fake mayor. And he might not be honest or a good mayor, but you can't say he's not interesting in a corrupt, peevish, servile, dirty, rotten scum type of way. Thank you for listening. If you dare, buy us a coffee. The link is in the description. Writing your metric in South Africa is definitely not what it used to be. Nili Sangingi lives with her mom, sister, niece and her three-year-old child. They all depend on the 350 grant to get by. Her mother also does temporary jobs to put food on the table. She is out now and will return with 200 rand, money that will buy food. It is a daily struggle. You used to be able to leave school knowing that you could go somewhere, get a job, an apprenticeship, or go to on to tertiary education and perhaps become something and make something of your life. In 2024, our grade 12s have started writing their metric exams, the final exams before they leave school for the last time and become people responsible for their own lives. It is what it is. It is, it is what it is. So in South Africa today, the metric pass rate of 2023 was 82.9%, reflecting an increase from the previous year. Now, 82.9% sounds reasonable, I guess. It should be closer to 100, if not 100. The problem is that the pass rate for many subjects in South African schools is 30%. You can pass knowing three things out of 10, knowing 30% of the things, that's not a pass. That's a quite definite fail. They are pushing anyone who gets 30 is being pushed through. They did not pass. Remember when the pass rate used to be 50%? We're yet to get 50. Anything lower than that, you fail. Today, 30% can get you by. That's ridiculous. What kind of people do you really think we're producing with 30% being a pass rate? And what does that person even begin to know? 82% of people passed, but how many of them were 30 percenters? Approximately 40% of students who started in grade 1 don't even make it to grade 12. And that's with a 30% pass rate. Imagine the people that didn't make it, what they were facing not to make it. Her mother is unemployed and she knows the pain of going to school hungry. It varies from days to days because sometimes fight, you know, and then that just becomes very toxic. I'm not as a person, I'm a very bubbly person and... I'm a very peaceful person. So when there's not peace, I can clean. Um, I, 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 like, I struggle to function and this was bad. Now what is the whole point? I'm doing this but depending on my land, but I want my mom to have like a house that she can call a home. The Eastern Cape class of 2023 achieved a pass rate of 81,4%, a tough target to improve on for the current matrix. What rubbish schools, what river they had to cross, so on and so forth, how many times they got pregnant, how hungry, how poor, all of this sort of thing, that they didn't even make it to grade 12. And a lot of them you know were hooked on Nyaobe or some other drug, right? It is what it is. It is what it is. So 40% of the people who enter grade 1 don't make it to grade 12. What is that person's job prospects and life prospects going forward, whether they're still of school age or whether they're over the age of 18? What is that person doing with their life and how are they contributing? And how many of them can actually say they're doing something very productive and are not a weight on the taxpayer? And then you wonder why a lot of girls are having grant babies. It is what it is. It is what it is. 
34% of matriculants typically qualify for university entrance. I don't think most people should go to university. I think very few people should, and we should only have our best of the best going there. University should only be for the best of the best academically, who are in that way inclined. For everyone else, there should be training colleges, training programs, apprenticeships, entrepreneurship, and so on. Become a member of this channel today on our Buy Me A Coffee page. You'll get exclusive members-only content, which are courses 15 to 30 minutes long. We add a new one every single month on various topics linked to the channel. When you're a member, you get access to all of them on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Check it out. The link is in the description. Youth unemployment, of course, for the people between the ages of 15 and 24, is at Ramaphosa level of 61%. Every time I go to school, I'm constantly worried about my family that I have left back home. I worry about what they are going to eat. I sit in class thinking how hungry my child must be and how she is getting by. I hardly concentrate in class. I can't even think straight knowing my family is hungry at home. Perhaps Ramaphosa could give some of these young people a job cleaning his sofas at Palapala. If 61% of the people between the ages of 15 to 24 are unemployed, and then every single year we're pumping out thousands of them out of matric, what does that mean? It means we're just adding more people onto the unemployment line, SRD grant line, grant baby line, I'm going to prison line, I'm bleeding the taxpayer line. It is what it is. It is what it is. 18% of grade 12 graduates proceed directly to university studies. Many of them, of course, will become fallists, wokists, and communists. Unfortunate, but it is the truth. And they will join the EFF student command and shout about white monopoly capital. A lot of them are becoming that sort of person, coming out of our universities with a victim mindset and miseducated at every level. Well, uh, I, I, I think um, South Africa is a movie. We live in a drama. It's a series. Every day you will be shocked by something new. Uh, we have even forgotten what shocked us two weeks ago. Mm. You know, every day. Roughly 65% of matriculants can't afford further education because they're poor, hungry, and the economy is rubbish. Only about 6% of grade 12 matriculants start their own businesses within a year of leaving, most of them out of necessity because they have no other prospects, which is not a bad reason to start a business. It is what it is. It is what it is. It is unfortunate that they don't have any other prospects. Even if their prospect was starting a business, they don't have the best environment this country could give them to start that business in. So we add to that 28% of matric graduates find formal employment within the first year, considering 18% go on to tertiary institutions. What's happening with the over 50% of young people that have left matric or are above 18 years old? What are they doing with their lives? What's up with them? So then 13% of grade 12 graduates enroll in TVET colleges. These people are making a very wise move, and I wish them well. They're learning how to be plumbers, electricians, and everything else like that. The problem is South Africa doesn't have enough TVET colleges or enough that are good enough to be pumping out really highly skilled artisans. This is where a lot of South African youth should be going and where South Africa, if the government was smart, should be investing their money. Subscribe to the channel or you'll be forced to join the MK party and become their most vigorous and fierce member like the Mama Joy of the MK. The South African matriculant lives in one of the greatest countries in the world but unfortunately, our government is so corrupt and so stupid that grade 12 learner would not be blamed for not thinking that. They might think they live in some poverty-stricken backwater on the southern tip of Africa, when unfortunately they live in one of the richest, most prosperous, most capable countries on earth that is at the moment performing far below its potential because of a government that wants it like that and wants those young people struggling. It is what it is. It is what it is. Every single year in this country, about 900,000 people register to do the National Senior Certificate, whether it's through their school or some other institution. 
Some of them are people who are rewriting. Some of them are adults who have gone back to school and so on. Some of them are rewriting to improve their marks so that they can qualify for some tertiary institution and of course for NFSIS. We now have a course on Teachable. It's for boys between the ages of 10 and 18, about 12 men from the Bible, where we teach about manhood, masculinity, and becoming a man. Check it out. However, it's shocking how many people don't actually complete those exams, even though over 900,000 register. Some drop out, some get sick, some are absent during the exams for any number of reasons. For instance, in 2023, while about 928,000 people registered to do that senior certificate, approximately only about 572,000 candidates passed those exams. In my view, it is not these young people, these grade 12 learners. The problem is very clear. We are building a dysfunctional society of underperforming schools with a job market that is non-existent because of draconian labor laws, a failing economy, and a government that's just staring an 82% student pass rate at 30% subject pass rate as an achievement. The conclusion is very simple. I'm speaking about this because the children actually are the future. It's not just a corny pop song by drug-addled pop stars. If we fail as a country to ensure a future for the young people of this country, we will have a banana republic going forward. Getting our children from grade 1 to matric with the best education possible with the best prospects possible after they leave matric is exactly what we should be doing and exactly what we should be working on every single day as a country. What we need is a conservative government made up largely of millennials who have been to the high-functioning Model C schools who understand the role that education plays in a country's development and the indoctrination that takes place and changes a person into a certain kind of citizen. That is what is necessary and what is needed. And if a government cannot do that, ask yourself, what is it that they are doing? Why are they allowing what is happening now to our grade 12s to happen? It's not just incompetence. They have very specific goals in mind that are not the goals that benefit our young people. A saying, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe what isn't true. The other is to refuse to believe what is true. Soren Kierkegaard. I recommend we look at school vouchers and homeschooling as a solution going forward and private schools set up by institutions, by individuals, by religious organizations and by rich men of vision. The case is closed, my friend. If we fail to indoctrinate our children well, we will live in a country of careless, reckless people, poverty-stricken and looking for a leader. That's exactly when the socialists step in. You remember that. Subscribe to the channel. If you don't, I know you're the one that burnt down Parliament. The GNU has a foreign policy problem. On one hand, you have the ANC, who align with China, support Russia, and love the Palestinians. On the other hand, you have the DA, who align with the West, support Ukraine, and love Israel when it's convenient for them. The GNU has a foreign policy problem because South Africa then would be moving in two different directions. Who will win? The ANC has put it out plain and clear that they are in charge of foreign policy as they have been for the last 30 years and that is not the DA's domain. The DA is saying the ANC is moving the country in the wrong direction with this and they should actually be moving and finding new alliances and leaning in a different direction. Let's get into this discussion now. The Democratic Alliance has slammed President Saul Ramaphosa for calling Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin a valuable ally. This was during the BRICS summit, the second largest party 
in the current government of national unity says it does not represent its view describing Russia as an authoritarian regime which has violated international law with its war on Ukraine. The ANC is definitely not going to change and it's impossible for them to. And the DA, being the liberals they are, are more likely to change. So either way, we're going to be moving to the wrong direction and I think the ANC might have the DA won on this one. What exactly is the problem for the Democratic Alliance when the president of South Africa says, and I quote, Russia is a valuable ally and a friend of South Africa? Good evening. Thank you for having me. Well, I think that the problem is twofold. Firstly, it seems as if uh, the president may have forgotten that his party uh, no longer enjoys an outright majority in government. And as such, the ANC are no longer at liberty to unilaterally determine South Africa's foreign policy positions without consulting their key partners in the government of national unity. That's but we can do better. Because both of them are a mistake. The way the ANC government has been running the foreign policy of South Africa for the last 30 years has been a mistake, actually. The DA will move us in a direction that is just not South Africa. Too liberal, too woke, and too affirming. That's just not South Africa. The true foreign policy of South Africa should be one with a far more conservative leaning. It should be very pragmatic, very logical, and very business and open market orientated. First thing, Africa. We should minimize our involvement in the AU. We should be as involved as little as possible with the African Union and want nothing really to do with them. We should be in the AU by name only, actually. We should exist within the AU in the way America exists in the UN. You have power in there and you have the ability to control things, but you don't really have to adhere to anything they say. Perfect. Because we are actually holding the cards to be able to do that. The AU is a defunct organization that's not going anywhere. For us, it should be almost a cosplay. We should be involved and show up to meetings, but it should not be that serious. We should be involved enough to know exactly what's going on, to have power in that organization and to direct it. But like I say, they should have no power to tell us to do anything. That's what a conservative government of South Africa would do. Become a member of this channel today on our Buy Me A Coffee page. You'll get exclusive members-only content, which are courses, 15 to 30 minutes long. We add a new one every single month on various topics linked to the channel. When you're a member, you get access to all of them on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Check it out. The link is in the description. Subscribe to the channel. If you don't, I know you're the one that burnt down Parliament. As far as Palestine goes, we would switch sides immediately and leave the Palestinians alone and tell them to lose our number. Because if the Palestinians were serious about building a people group and building their little area into something, they would have turned it into a Singapore or Hong Kong a long time ago. The scam of the Palestinians is that they want the money from the UN and their leaders have to keep them poor and fighting with the Israelis and as permanent refugees so that that money keeps flowing. The Palestinian thing is a scam and any allegiance the ANC ever had to the Palestinians does not need to be our allegiance going forward. We should use the same policy for anyone else who's like the Palestinians and we should use the same principle for any other group anywhere in the world that's similar to this. We should not align ourselves with the sort of ideology that permeates the Palestinian cause. As far as BRICS is concerned, the BRICS family has an important role in addressing the key challenges of the global south in partnership with like-minded emerging market economies. We look forward to the report that will be given by our finance ministers and central bank governors on the use of local currencies in international trade and financial transactions between BRICS members and their trading partners. They in BRICS but should want a bigger role because we are the gateway to Africa and we should be working very hard every day to make sure that China and Russia do not become the dominant voice over Africa. We should be working hard to develop SADC into a powerful force. We should then be brokering deals all over Africa 
and working very hard to do that, just like the Chinese and the Russians are, but tying them back into this powerful region we have down here in SADC and the access we have all over Africa as leverage for more power in BRICS. And we should use BRICS as a leverage against the West, not because we're choosing against the West, but we should view the West and BRICS in the way someone who has two competing job offers would. He uses one to leverage better outcomes or a better offer out of the other. And he does that back and forth between the two all the time. We should not choose a side between BRICS or the West. We should stand independently and become a relevant country with a strong economy, with control over SADC, the most powerful networks in Africa, with a booming economy so that we're relevant. We become an important country outright and people want to court us. We shouldn't be asking for a seat at the table everywhere we go. Uh, it will help us not to participate as unequal cousins in these institutions. It will help us to participate fully and uh, so that we don't have a sense that we are beggars, that we are being dealt with uh, out of generosity. I think it's important in the new era that the world is in now that uh, there should be a good measure of equality among sovereign nations. If you're doing that, you're already losing. And BRICS for us should be a partnership that we use to our advantage and we should do the same with the West and we leverage the two against each other because we are the primary portal to Africa. That's how our foreign policy should be. We shouldn't be siding with either one because either one could be our friends or our enemy tomorrow. Let's take a lesson from Ukraine. Ukraine wanted to push west and ended up being in trouble with Russia because Russia saw that as an encroachment to them, as an encroachment of the west right on their border if Ukraine became part of the EU. Now the lesson of Ukraine is very simple for South Africa. We don't need to side with them or be against them. It's none of our business. Ukraine could not defend itself in the end and needed someone else to defend them. It needed help from the Western Europeans who were not that keen to do it in the first place. You you want you you could do so you you do you could you you want you want and the Americans are using it as a proxy war to test out all their new stuff while the Ukrainians are dying and test out how they would fight the Russians if they had to. The Russians are trying to take back the territory and expand and create a buffer to protect themselves against the West. Don't be Ukraine. Have a strong economy and a strong military so that you can defend yourself, that you can fend people off. That's the lesson South Africa has to take. South Africa doesn't need to be for Ukraine or against it. We need to learn from it. Don't be like them. They were ill-prepared. They were running a dysfunctional government. They had no military to stand up on and their economy was frail. They could not stand for themselves. If a country can't stand for themselves, you will be the puppet for some other country's desires like they are now for Russia and for the US and for the Western Europeans. And everyone else will post your flag on their social media. But how does that help you when the men of your country are dying? South Africa should take a lesson from that and not be like them at all. We now have a course on Teachable. It's for boys between the ages of 10 and 18, about 12 men from the Bible, where we teach about manhood, masculinity, and becoming a man. Check it out. The way forward is simple. If we're ever pushed into a corner to choose between the two, do we choose the BRICS side or do we choose the West? We always choose the West. That's actually what South Africa is. It's a mixture of African values and Western values, love it or hate it. That's what the country is. And it actually can work very well if the countries run well, if we're not trying to beat each other over the head and dominate each other every five seconds, and we actually realize what we can build and just build on those principles. Take up the reality that you are in Africa, this is where the country is, and then take up the values that build great countries. And a lot of those have been Western values. And you mix those two things, 
now you're starting to build a good country. And if we ever pushed into a situation where we have to choose, you never choose Russia, you never choose China because the internal logic of the political ideology of those two countries is not in line with us and it's not something we believe in. China can imprison whole groups of people because of their religion or their ethnicity. We do not want to be like that country and they constantly are in surveillance of people and you can disappear from the top businessman to a peasant on the street. You can disappear. And Russia, that's just this puzzle shop that uh, Vladimir Putin runs. We do not want to be run like that at all. If we are going to choose, we choose on values. And we choose the Western values, whether those Western countries are still in line with those values themselves or not. That's not our problem. If America wants to turn communist, if Canada wants to turn communist, if European countries want to turn socialist, that's up to them. We choose the values that built those great countries. We're not saying we want to be them. We're going to be ourselves. We do not choose the Palestinians because we're not in a struggle. We're trying to be a country that thrives, like Singapore. We're not trying to get stuck in the mud, fighting blood feuds that will never end, that will always result in killing and your people moving backwards. The South African foreign policy for the last 30 years has not been very good. And in the GNU, you see the two sides, the ANC aligned to China, supporting Russia and loves the Palestinians. The DA, aligned to the West, supports Ukraine and loves Israel when it's convenient. The ANC is too far left, too irresponsible, too corrupt and too socialist. The DA is too libertine, too liberal, too socialist and too flexible to ever build a great country. We will turn our kids into people who don't even know if they're a boy or a girl if we follow the DA and if we follow the ANC will turn them into perpetual victims that want the white man to throw them a dry piece of bread while a fly flies into their mouth. Either way, that's not South Africa. South Africa is a conservative country in Africa with African values and a superstructure of Western values and a mixture of the two and can build a great country. There's a reason why South Africa is the best country to live in on Africa. If you're going to be born anywhere in Africa, you want to be born in South Africa. And it can be one of the best countries in the world if it's properly run and the foreign policy would reflect that. The conclusion is very simple. South Africa needs to be a relevant country. We don't need to pick sides. And if we're ever forced to, we pick the mixture of African values and Western values in the African context because that's who this country is. A saying, the most painful state of being is remembering the future, particularly the one you'll never have. Soren Kierkegaard. The future of this country will be determined in part by which direction we pick, the ANC foreign policy or the DA foreign policy. I say both are imposters and should be rejected. We choose a far more conservative, logical, free market view that I've outlined in this video. African values mixed with Western values in the African context. That's South Africa. And that's what our foreign policy should be. We build rather a relevant country that can pick friends and partners whenever it chooses to because it has the gateway to Africa, it has a strong economy, and it's one of the best countries in the world and we can pick and choose our own friends. We don't have to be forced into friendships with anybody because we don't need them. We can always do business with someone else because we're that relevant. That should be our goal. If that's not our goal, you end up like Ukraine. The case is closed, my friend. The GNU has a foreign policy problem. Both of their answers are wrong. Thank you for listening. If you dare, buy us a coffee. The link is in the description.
I once saw an old woman trying to take off these abortion posters off the street lamps and electricity boxes and the walls on a South African street, those wrinkled little hands trying to tear that stuff off. She couldn't do it because I don't know what these people use as glue for these things. This is some high-tech demonic stuff. Either way, South Africa looks filthy, disgusting and like a banana republic. I am wholly and utterly opposed to abortion in every single way and I think it is murder because it is. However, this video isn't just about abortion alone. It's about those filthy posters that we've allowed to proliferate the South African landscape and the South African cityscape and to make us look like deranged lunatics who advertise baby murder like it's buying a packet of chips. Come on now, dog. Come on, man. When you let your country become so filthy, you know that you have lost your mind, you are uncivilized, and you will find it difficult to build a great country because you're killing the future, quite literally. Said to me, oh, okay, you know it's gonna cost you a thousand five, but if it's between me and you, I can do it for you for five hundred. And we went into a dodgy room, and some guy just took me into the back room, into a dark and he told me to lie on the, on the floor and he started putting things inside me. You need to understand that the people who sell this are nameless, faceless, and many of them are illegal immigrants. Illegal immigrants who have traveled from afar to enter the country illegally to sell an illegal service because they're not a doctor or a specialized kind of nurse, which are the only two people allowed to perform this procedure this murder in South Africa. They come then and put up a poster illegally because you need a special license to put up these sort of posters on South African street poles. And then as if that wasn't enough, they've come all that way, committed all those illegal acts to murder little South Africans. And their posters stay up there for months, if not years. We now have a course on Teachable. It's for boys between the ages of 10 and 18 about 12 men from the Bible, where we teach about manhood, masculinity, and becoming a man. Check it out. Why don't the police phone these people? Why isn't there a police unit that finds these people? Because what they've done is illegal, and it's linked to at least four other illegal acts, as I've described. Why not phone it, show up, undercover policewoman, looks pregnant, policemen storm in, arrest them, break up the whole place? It's because we've built a decaying lawless country that doesn't care for the rule of law, that has lost its mind. We've gone all the way in and we've abandoned reason. And these posters that turn the country into a filthy den show us this. They show that South Africa has lost its mind and has become lawless. It has become freedom unchecked. There's such a thing as being free, but there's such a thing as being libertine and loose and careless and evil where even the murdering of your own children is seen as just a procedure that you can do between things, an errand of sorts. When things fall apart, this is what they look like. This is what a country looks like when it's fallen apart and lost its mind and has to be stopped. And someone has to stand upon the wall and yell stop and say we will not become this third world banana republic. We will not look at the sign of these posters and do nothing, because these posters are a sign of a collapsing, decaying country. You shall not pass! Someone has to yell stop. It's not the socialist MK, EFF types, they love baby murder. They are more levitine than the liberals. The liberal DA types won't do it either because it's her choice. It's her body, her choice. Well, no, that little body in her stomach isn't her body. That's a whole other person with their own DNA, with their own fingers, with their own toes, and with their own mind. Subscribe to the channel or you'll be forced to join the MK party and become their most vigorous and fierce member like the mama joy of the MK. When a country lets this happen, and lets these signs proliferate all over the place. You know that it has lost its mind, it has lost its morality, and something has fallen apart. If the EFF types won't stop it, which they can't, they love it, and the 
libertine DA types won't stop it because everyone can do whatever they want, especially when it's to someone else. Back to what I always say, that a conservative, right-leaning party with strict values needs to rule this country. South Africa legalized abortion in 1997 and it can be done within the first 12 weeks of pregnancy. Thereafter, women who are pregnant for 13 weeks or more can terminate under certain circumstances. Abortion is free at government hospitals, but however, few clinics uh, offer them and many women risk their lives using illegal abortion facilities. And these posters would not proliferate in a country ruled by a conservative party because then they couldn't call themselves conservative. Because first of all, you wouldn't let illegal people just jump over the fence. Secondly, you wouldn't let people just put up posters without the right permits. Thirdly, you wouldn't let baby murder become a trade and industry like selling chips on the street corner. And fourth, you wouldn't let them murder the baby and carry on doing that as if it's normal. It's very simple. These posters are a sign to us of what this country has become and it is a sign that we have lost our mind and are collapsing. And the DA won't stop it and the MK and the EFF and the ANC definitely won't stop it. It's time for something different. It's time for a more right-leaning conservative party that will stop all four of these crimes, especially the baby murder. Become a member of this channel today on our Buy Me A Coffee page. You'll get exclusive members-only content which are courses 15 to 30 minutes long. We add a new one every single month on various topics linked to the channel. When you're a member, you get access to all of them on our Buy Me A Coffee page. Check it out. The link is in the description. Subscribe to the channel or Cyril Ramaphosa will be president forever. In conclusion, South Africa should be looking for a government that will stop all four crimes, starting with illegal immigration, with illegal businesses, with illegal acts to market your business or to do whatever you want to government property, with posters that are on there for months with glue that causes damage and rips the paint off when you take it off, and of course, with baby murder. Abortion should not be something we do in South Africa. We should rather be building institutions and facilities that help mothers take care of their children for the first two years, providing them with what they need if we have to, but that's after we cancel social grants. That is the approach we should be taking and not murdering innocent little South Africans. A saying, face the facts of what you are, for that is what changes what you are. Soren Kierkegaard. And what South Africa is at the moment is a baby murdering factory that is littered with dirty, disgusting posters that ruin the landscape, that ruin the cityscapes, and we act as if it is normal to view these things every single day as they ruin the scenery of our country, they ruin the brain, and they make the heart sick. South Africa is not the country I grew up in. South Africa has lost its mind, and we need to restore that. Ramaphosa is not going to do it, Malema is not going to do it, and Jacob Zuma is definitely not going to do it. He only cares about Jacob Zuma. John Stianazen is not going to do it, Helen Zilla is not going to do it, if anything, those two are the ones that are going to be encouraging people to murder their children and calling it health care. These posters are a sign of a decaying, decrepit country that has lost its mind and morality. We need to stop that. We need a conservative party that will stand on the values come what may, that will admit what we are as a country and where we need to go to change that. I recommend you start readying yourself for that party rather than putting your hopes in, in any of the ones that exist now because none of them will stop it. Not even the ACDP. They haven't got their act together enough. These filthy posters have been up every single day that the ACDP has existed. The case is closed, my friend. South Africa has become decrepit and we need to make sure we change that going forward. We need a conservative party that does not abide filthy dirty, rotten posters that are a sign of a filthy, dirty people who have lost their minds. Thank you for listening. If you dare, buy us a coffee. The link is in the description.
Sanity.